Hi everybody, welcome to our Entrepreneur Mindset webinar focusing on writing copy for your website. My name is Nick Allen and I'm the Marketing Events Manager at Simple Practice and I will be the moderator for the webinar today. Before we get started, I just wanted to share that this webinar is being recorded and you will receive the slides and recording in our follow-up email going out tomorrow morning. If you are having any technical difficulties during this webinar, we suggest that you refresh your page or re-enter the webinar. We're very excited to have our speaker, Dr. Michaela Bucaneri, to help guide our audience through a topic that many clinicians have voiced is their biggest obstacle, writing copy for their websites. I do want to add that Michaela has graciously built a worksheet to go along with this presentation, and you can find that in the GoToWebinar page you are currently viewing this webinar from. Without further ado, I'll pass it over to Michaela to tell us about herself and her work. Hi, thanks so much for having me. I'm Michaela Bucuneri. I'm a licensed psychologist and a copy coach for health and wellness professionals. I love partnering with healers and helpers of all different sorts to bring more of your in-session magic to your online presence. And so today we're gonna to be focusing on just one place where this can happen, which is through the words on your site. So I wanna start by posing this question to you. If you knew you'd be someone's only experience of our field, what would you wanna communicate? What would feel most important to convey? I love this question because it reminds us of a couple of important things. First, it reminds us that we have choice in how we represent ourselves online. We don't have to simply default to what we've been taught directly or indirectly about what it means to show up online as a professional. And next, it reminds us that each time we create a piece of copy, whether that's a page of our website or a tiny little Instagram caption, we're giving the people on the other side of those words an impression, an experience of our field, for better or worse. And so it's both a responsibility and an opportunity. So I want you to keep that in mind as we go through this today. Because I believe we possess natural superpowers, natural communication superpowers in our work. But unfortunately, there are some common ways we unwittingly undermine our own communication efforts. And this can really hurt our ability to connect meaningfully with the people that we're trying to reach. Now, there's a lot to say on this topic, to be sure, and so this is not an exhaustive summary of the topic by any means. Instead, what I wanna do today is share three very common ways that we undermine our communication efforts in representing ourselves in words online. I wanna highlight what you can do instead, some alternatives. I'm gonna share some simple actions you can test out in your business today. And we're gonna close by going through some of the questions that you've shared. Mistake number one is trying to speak to everyone. Now, I'm sure you've heard it said, if you try to reach everybody, you'll end up reaching nobody. And it's true on a very practical level. If you think about trying to craft a sentence, that will grab the attention or accurately reflect the lived experience of many different segments of the population, it quickly falls apart, it quickly loses focus, and so it's not going to be as compelling a sentence. It's easier to craft meaningful, effective copy when you have someone specific in mind. The solution is to know who you're trying to reach. Have a pretty focused picture in your mind of the, the type of client that you're trying to attract to your practice. And some ways you can do this um, are to, first of all, picture a one-on-one -on -one conversation. To the extent that you can think about copywriting, the words on your site as approximating a real life one-on-one -on -one conversation, it's going to be so much more natural, conversational, and ultimately effective. So you can always help yourself out by reading back a paragraph that you've written and ask yourself, is this how I'd say it in person? And if the answer is no, it's worth a second pass. It's worth going back and trying to make it more approachable, make it more digestible. And I'll share some specific ways that you can do that. But that's your first filter is, am I truly approximating speaking to one person? I also recommend making use of an exercise called no feel and do. You can jot this down on a post-it or keep it somewhere handy. I always have it right on my desk because it's such a helpful mental cue to me whenever I'm writing. The gist is very simple. For everything that you're writing, you wanna ask yourself, by the time the person reading this is done interacting with this piece of copy, what do I want them to know? How do I want them to feel? 
and what do I want them to do? What this is going to do is help focus your writing. First of all, by keying into what you want the person to know as a result of reading what you've written, it forces you to have a point in mind, to have a takeaway, an end goal. Next, by considering how do I want them to feel, this is gonna tap into your natural empathy. You wanna use everything that you know or can reasonably guess about the emotional state of the person who is landing on your website. What have they already tried? What are they feeling at this point? What questions do they have? You can use this to help you key into a specific tone and a specific emotional quality you wanna to bring to that piece of writing. And while it's true that you'll have a certain kind of writing voice that you adopt on your website that kind of cuts across wherever they might find you online, hopefully it looks like a consistent picture of, of the person that you are, but you can think about it like a sound mixing board. The emotional quality, the tone can change depending on what you're writing and for what purpose. And so by asking that question of how do I want them to feel at the end, it might be uplifted, invigorated, gently challenged, whatever it might be. Keep that in mind and then that's gonna help you focus in your writing that much more. And finally, by asking what do I want them to do, this helps you land on a call to action. You might've heard that term. This is simply an invitation to the person reading your words to take some sort of next step, ideally toward working with you. So on the home page, what do I want them to do might be to hop over to your services page or your about page. Maybe from your services page, the call to action is an invitation to book a consultation call with you. Always have a clear picture in your mind for every single thing you're writing of what do I want them to know, how do I want them to feel, and what do I want them now to do. And your writing is gonna be so much more effective. My final tip to you here is to take a clear stance in the words on your website. And we're not talking about being unnecessarily polarizing or getting into fights on the internet. What we are talking about is equipping your prospective client with everything that they need to make an informed decision about whether to work with you or not. You might have heard it said that clear is kind and I wholeheartedly agree. You know your client best, you know who you're trying to reach. Ask yourself, what is a priority for them? What words or phrases or pieces of information are they filtering um, my website through to, under to try and determine whether they wanna work with me? This will look different for everyone. You can think of these as terms or phrases that are like little beacons, little signals that have personal relevance and meaning to the people on the other side of the screen. So maybe you want to make it totally clear that you are anti-racist, that your practice is trans affirming, weight neutral, whatever it is for you. You can also think about um, terms that are maybe considered edging into jargon. We'll talk about that in a moment, but they might be specific technical words or phrases that you know the person you're trying to reach is actively searching by. Then it might be important to include those so that that, again, signals to them clear information that they're in the right place. So consider that for yourself. What's one line I can draw for my dream clients to help them make an informed decision about working with me or not. Again, part of the benefit of taking this clear stance is that it hopefully helps people self-select into the experience of working with you or select out. It's kind to be as clear as you can because then it gives people the information, even if ultimately they don't end up working with you, it gives them that information clearly and quickly so that they don't have to figure it out on a call with you or in a session. Second very common mistake we make is overcomplicating the message on our websites. We try to do too much all at once and it ends up muddying the waters. So instead what we want to do is think simply. We want to simplify, simplify, simplify everywhere that we can. And one way that we can do that very practically is to incorporate plenty of white space on the page. So compared to reading a book or engaging with words somewhere else, when we are reading online, our brains are primed for a skim. We're in scroll mode right from the get-go, and we expect to find plenty of margin on the page. It really helps us engage more actively with what we're reading. And so by keeping our paragraphs short, 
in some cases just a line or two. It really facilitates people moving down the page with you, which is what we want. Next, we wanna be mindful of jargon on our website. And so these are those in-group professional terms and phrases that are meaningful in conversation with professional colleagues and peers, but likely aren't terribly meaningful to the people that you're trying to reach and attract to your practice. Now, this is one place where I really see this archetype of the professional get in our way in some unhelpful ways. It can cause us to represent ourselves in a more dry, formal, stilted way than we naturally would, certainly more than we would in person with our clients. And so it's important to, first of all, identify how much jargon is currently on my website. So I've linked a tool for you here. It's freely accessible online at scienceandpublic.com, but it allows you to free enter or copy and paste in whole sections of copy, and it will give it a color-coded prioritized rating of how jargony it actually is. What you can do this way is go through and just become more aware of possible jargon in your copy and then go through and for anything that's given kind of a high priority rating um, for jargon content, you can rework it to make it more accessible. Now, generally speaking, the issue with jargon is that <laughs> at best, it's not terribly meaningful to the people that we're trying to reach. At worst though, it can widen the already existing gap in our field between the helper and the person seeking help. Of course, in reality, we're all both, but it can really expand that power differential in some ways that can cause harm for the people that we're trying to reach. However, there are some notable exceptions when using some jargon judiciously might make sense. So one, I've already mentioned, if you know, for example, that your client is filtering their search through some particular terms that will signal specialized expertise that they're looking for, or someone who has a very specific sort of competency to work with them, then if you know that that fits how you practice, that fits within your scope, it, it might make sense to include those terms. Again, it's all about what's gonna benefit the client's search and align with how you actually work. Another exception to using jargon would be for an educational purpose. So let's say you want to create a piece of content that educates about some type of, some aspect of the work that you do. You can embed the jargon term in some relevant context using relatable examples, something that's gonna help anchor that and facilitate learning for the people on the other side of the screen. Finally, and this one's almost laughably simple, is to embrace the contraction. So part of representing ourselves as professionals online, we tend to avoid using contractions. Lots of different reasons this could be. Um, some of us have some internalized learnings about how, how formal we need to be writing in our work life, in our roles as business owners. But the truth is, and a lot of this comes back to, again, how our brains interact with the written word online, we often will take in words that we're reading as though they're being read aloud. And so it can make quite a profound difference in how natural and accessible your writing feels to the people reading it online, whether you use contractions or not. So let me just give you one very simple example. Here on the left, this is one passage that incorporates no contractions. In my practice, I am often asked by parents, how should I respond to my child when they are experiencing strong emotions? Based on the available research, there is good reason to believe that it is not so much about what you say versus on the right. Again, same passage, just swapped in with some contractions. In my practice, I'm often asked by parents, how should I respond to my child when they're experiencing strong emotions? Based on the available research, there's good reason to believe that it's not so much about what you say you see the difference? If you try this out right now, if you do nothing else, this is just such a quick way. This and probably hitting, uh, hitting enter a few times to infuse more white space on the page. I promise it's going to make your writing so much easier to read. It's gonna keep people on the page. And in this example, it's actually gonna help them digest what they're reading more quickly and more easily. It's amazing. It's a very simple shift, but um, it works, I promise. 
Finally, mistake number three is centering our own experience in our writing. Now this is something that is so common and most of us are not doing it intentionally, but by the time we reach the point in our career where we have our own website, maybe we've just made the move to private practice, it's not only very exciting, we've spent a lot of time thinking and dreaming about what would go on our website, how to talk about our work, we're also just, we've, we've effectively lost much of our perspective when it comes to talking about our work because we're so immersed. We have been focused on our education, our training, our work for so long that it, it's very difficult to step outside of that and see it with fresh eyes. So the solution here is simply to put the client front and center. The client really is what our website is all about and it's who our website ultimately is for. So the first thing you can do is anticipate with some empathy. What is that client looking for when they come to the website? Again, this is where you don't have to default to just what you've always been taught about a professional website. What is your client looking for? What questions do they have that are a priority for them to be answered? Again, you can go back to um, know, feel, and do, what, how are they feeling likely by the time they make it onto my website? How can I meet them there? How can I shift the way that I'm talking about the work that I do um, in a way that actually speaks to them? One simple way to do this is to craft some simple copy that mirrors their experience, that captures with as much accuracy as you can what they're actually wondering about and feeling and going through. This is gonna signal authority and credibility in a way that goes so far beyond what simply regurgitating your professional credentials will do. Next, you wanna go through and reframe anything that you are saying on your website from their perspective. And so this is where this idea of conversational copy comes in. Again, back to this idea of trying to approximate. The words on our website are designed to approximate an in-person conversation, that's what you're doing here as well, is that you wanna take everything that you could share about, say, the work that you do or your approach to your work from their perspective. How can I make it more meaningful to them from their perspective on my website? So asking yourself, what is the purpose of me including this information on my website? Does it just feel good to me or is it actually adding something meaningful and important to the therapy seeker? Is this actually going to enhance their experience? Is this information that they need in order to take the next step to pursue working with me? Or is this just stuff I'm adding just because? Now, oftentimes, most of the time, it is important information that you want to include. It does serve a real purpose, and it's more about how you frame it. So in this case, it's helpful, I think, to look at a couple of examples. One that comes up a lot was that you'll say something like, I enjoy using humor in my therapeutic work. There's nothing technically wrong with this, but it's not framing it from the client's perspective. It's all about you and what you enjoy. And so simply shifting it to, we'll probably laugh together in some of our sessions. You see how different that is? You see how it's so much more about the person on the other side of that screen. Another example is talking about um, some of your techniques that you use. I like to utilize narrative techniques in my work with clients. Stepping back, using a little bit of creativity and trying to make it more conversational could yield a version of this that sounds more like, Stories are powerful and can help shape our reality. We'll uncover stories you've been carrying about you, about the world that no longer serve you, and etc. So it doesn't have to be elaborate. In this case, that, that example is a little bit longer than what you started out with, but you get so much more mileage out of it. You're helping, you're helping demystify, first of all, the process of working with you. It's kind of a peek behind the curtain to see what are we actually gonna be doing so that can be helpful information to include. But it also is written as though you can picture yourself saying that out loud to a client when you're orienting them. So that's one question you can ask yourself as well in framing it from their, their perspective is, what kinds of points of clarification might I offer on a consultation call? 
then working backwards, go ahead and pre-plant that on your website, in your copy, because those are questions your people are likely having and you can just adopt that same conversational tone, but give them the information up front that much sooner. And my last tip to you in putting the client front and center in your words, don't try to do all the talking. You don't have to own 100% responsibility for generating words out of thin air. It is perfectly allowed to pull from available sources that will give you some unique insights into words that are gonna reach your clients. And the easiest way to do that is to use their words, either the words of clients you've actually worked with or um, populations that they represent online. So I'll give you a couple of different options here. So wherever you can, you wanna use words that capture your client's experience. Their, their struggles, their hopes and goals for the future, their values, their interests, insights that they've developed, questions that they have. And you could get really creative in where you pull this information. For example, um, for sure you can be taking notes on your consultation calls. What are themes that come up? Often, right, you'll have the experience of, gosh, I'm answering this question a lot lately, or there, this is a real theme this, this week. Um, all the calls that I've taken, this same question has come up, or this same issue has been emerging. Think about that, start viewing that as like a golden thread that's running through all these different representatives of the population you work with. This is a real opportunity. Pull that theme, note it down, because that is a wonderful candidate, ripe for repurposing somewhere on your website. And again, you're always being judicious about this. You always are being mindful about confidentiality. But when we think thematically, you're able to see, okay, this is a topic. This is kind of a, a kernel of an idea that belongs somewhere on my website. Because again, it's gonna send those meaningful signals that draw in the right people. And by the way, if you're not practicing yet, or maybe you are practicing, but you're not yet working with the sorts of clients that you want to ultimately, you can still use this approach. You just have to think a bit more creatively and ask yourself, where are representatives of the groups that I wanna work with hanging out um, right now online? And so you can take kind of a fly on the wall researchers approach and identify some top content creators or channels or accounts online and comb through the content of the posts, read through the comments, see what kinds of questions and themes. Again, once you start thinking in terms of themes that are emerging, you're gonna discover how much is truly out there. And what's cool is that if you continue to do that research, you get in the habit of looking for those sorts of themes in content that's posted online, once you're actively working with the kinds of clients you want to be working with more, you can start noticing areas where the two converge around certain words, phrases, um, descriptors, metaphors, examples. Anytime you, not you notice something like that, that is a prime example for copy that's right for repurposing somewhere on your website. I'm going to give you a couple examples um, from real therapists who are doing this. This is my client, Carolyn. Carolyn works with clients experiencing anxiety and perfectionism. And when we were working together on Carolyn's therapy site, and we were going through the copy that she had sourced from different places, she noticed a theme start to emerge. And so a, a topic that was coming up quite a bit on consultation calls, in her conversations with clients, in many of the online pieces of content that she was sourcing and reviewing, there was this theme emerging that in order to achieve success, in order to get where they wanted to go in life, they had to slog their way through um, just awful challenges, like life just had to be a struggle for a while. So she identified this as a priority piece of copy um, to go somewhere on her website. And so we ended up working on it and creating this headline on the about page of her website. You don't have to struggle in order to be successful. And that is such a clear signal to the types of clients that Carolyn wants to draw into her practice that it's worked and she's heard from people how strongly the copy on her website resonates with their experience. My client Mara is another great example. In reviewing her notes from consultation calls with prospective clients, she was noticing that there was a, a subgroup of folks who would reach out to her who, after talking with her, would say, gosh, I feel so connected to you. I think you'll be an awesome fit to work with. 
when it's the right time. But for this, that, or the other reason, I'm just not I'm not ready to get started right now. Um, but I'll keep your information. I want to stay in touch so that ultimately I can work with you. And this informed our decision to create an exit intent pop-up so that when someone is on her website and starting to navigate away, this little window will pop up that says, not up for therapy just yet? We get it. Let's stay in touch till the timing's right. Again, this is pulled directly from real life copy, real life words that Mara's dream clients, the people she wanted to be working with, were, were telling her. She just took note of it, noticed the theme emerging, and that directly informed some strategic copy for her website. So if you're even a little bit interested in this, the best place to get started is to create a simple copy bank of your dream client's words. Again, you can be sourcing these from the different examples I mentioned or someplace else that you think of, but start collecting them in one place. And the easiest way to do that really is to just start now, block off an hour or so to grab as many excerpts as you can. These might be loose words or phrases. You might be calling some of them to mind from memory. Others, you might have actual physical notes. Again, you can do a little deep dive on social media, check out certain key accounts and just peruse the comments, start noticing words and phrases. And my, my encouragement to you is you don't necessarily have to know where a piece of copy will live on your website. It's not like it's instantly gonna jump out at you where it should go. Sometimes we just have a sense like, there might be something here, I'm just gonna add it to the copy bank. And you'll be amazed at how quickly you start amassing this kind of treasure trove of words and phrases. Also, this just feels good because it guards against that awful blinking cursor struggle we've all experienced when you're sitting down to write a piece of content or some words for your website. You're not starting from scratch. You are starting with this really useful resource of information to draw from. And then making this an ongoing habit will really serve you well. I recommend setting some kind of recurring reminder in your calendar, monthly or even weekly, to update your copy bank with new information. So this might look like at the end of the month, you go back and go through all of your notes that you took from consultation calls and you pull out any themes or keywords or phrases that you liked, add them to the bank and move on. As far as where you practically store this, I've had clients that just set up a simple Google Doc that works just fine. Others prefer something um, with a little more organization capabilities like a spreadsheet or a project management tool. Whatever works best for you is what works best for this. In time, as it gets larger and larger, you'll probably find that it's helpful to have some loose way of reorganizing and categorizing it just so that you're not reinventing the wheel. But to start out, a simple Google Doc or the Notes app on your phone even does wonders. Okay, I'm gonna go through and share some thoughts on the questions that you submitted ahead of time. So Karina asked, should your content be super niche to a specific audience or general to target a larger community? Now, you can probably already guess what I'm gonna say here based on what I've already shared today, but I do recommend focusing it meaningfully to reflect the people that you're trying to reach. It can be helpful to think about this from an SEO perspective. So remember that your client, the person that you're trying to reach is entering actual search terms. So whether they're stress Googling at 2 a.m. or they're sitting down and searching for people who can help them with what they're dealing with, maybe during a break at work, whatever it is, they're entering in certain questions. And based on those searches, Google is gonna serve them up results that it thinks align with reliable, trustworthy sources of information on the topics that they're entering those search terms about. So as best you can, you wanna create content on your site that helps Google categorize your website. You don't want it to be serving up your website as an answer to questions that really don't reflect the people that you're trying to work with. So while it's true, you could probably be creating content on any number of different topics. Step back and ask yourself, is this what I wanna be known for? For sure, I could create a great blog post on this topic. Is this who I want to draw in and attract? Bringing it back to the strategy, ultimately any piece of content you're creating is designed to help draw people back to your website. And so think about who do you actually want to invite there? Hope that helps. Teresa asked, how often should you be updating your copy on your website? So the annoying answer, Teresa, is it depends. 
generally speaking, we want the words on our website to accurately reflect the reality of our practice, who we are, how we're working, um, who we're working with. And so two basic guidelines you can follow are that you wanna update the words on your website when you've had some sort of major shift, either in your specialties or your expertise or some of the logistics around how you're working or in response to something external, something happening in the world that's gonna affect your practice and the people that you're working with. So one clear example of that is during COVID, many sites suddenly incorporated a statement about how folks could access care, any precautions that were in place, any um, ways that schedules were being affected. That would be another example of when it would make sense to update your website. But generally speaking, once the copy is up, as long as it's working well for you, you don't need to be messing with it. Now, one thing that your site definitely can benefit from updating continually is content. So I do recommend having some sort of a content hub on your website. Let's just take a blog, for example. Let's say that you have a simple blog on your website. Getting in the habit of regularly creating new content is gonna send a nice, clear, consistent signal, again, to Google, that's gonna help mark your site as credible, trustworthy, reliable, all those good things that are gonna benefit it in search so that when your people are looking for help with what they're dealing with, you're gonna come up. James asked, do you find having a blog and social media helps to drive attention to your practice? Yes, James, although within that, you have a lot of different choices for how you wanna set things up. It's absolutely not a requirement to have a presence every single place online that you possibly could. Not only is that a recipe for potential overwhelm and burnout, but it's not necessarily going to get you the results that you're looking for. What's much more important is to ask yourself, who am I trying to reach? Again, back to that fundamental question, and where where can content best serve them? So you can think about this from the SEO perspective again. By having a blog, for example, that is going to help give your site more credibility from that perspective. It's going to keep it active. It's going to be much more likely to be pushed out in results um, in search. From a client experience perspective, content is also really helpful in facilitating that relationship building and giving them a sense of what it would be like to interact with you in person. This is so important given the work that we do. It's a huge part of the perceived fit um, when we're actually interacting with a client. And so asking yourself, what is most aligned with my strengths? Where do I feel best about representing myself online? And where are my clients currently likely to be looking for that information. So that can help you key into a particular social media platform if you want. What I've used before and what I recommend is identifying some place to host your core content. So this might be a blog, a podcast, a YouTube channel, some place where you are creating one very value-packed, rich piece of information, say weekly. And then from there, you can harvest it for little gems that can be repurposed on social media. That's what I recommend. I think that's a strategic approach and it's, it's much more manageable, practically speaking, than creating fresh content everywhere. So for example, let's say you have a blog post that has three key points to it. You might pull in one point or one example beneath that point and create a social media post that repurposes that. No matter what kind of content you're creating though, I think there's a real benefit in housing it on your website. And so I mentioned earlier having some sort of a content hub and going back to Teresa's question, updating it regularly, sending that signal that this is a live website, it's not a museum, <laughs> um, there's someone behind this generating new information all the time. Hosting it there can not only serve up really valuable information to your clients, but it's gonna send those clear signals in search. So maybe that's a blog that you host right there on your website, or if you happen to have a podcast, for example, by repurposing episodes as posts on your website, it's gonna achieve that same aim. Hope that helps. Finally, Angelica asked, is it better to have all of your content on a single page or do you recommend having multiple pages? I recommend having multiple pages and that's for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's 
easier to navigate for the client, for the person that lands on the website. If they have some meaningful anchors, say in the navigation menu that they can click over to when they're looking for a particular piece of information, it's gonna give them a better experience than just scrolling down one really long page. That's not to say, however, that we wanna give them a million different options. I'm all for keeping a nice, um, tidy menu that's, that's not overwhelming, that gives them just what they're looking for and nothing more. Again, remember, you're not having to tell them everything, you're just giving them enough information to help facilitate the process of reaching out to you. This is also helpful from Google's perspective though, because having meaningfully labeled pages that each have a certain topic covered on them is going to help Google categorize your website. It's gonna send information that helps them determine what users can find on individual pages, and ultimately that's just gonna benefit you even more. So this will depend on who you're trying to reach and how you work, et cetera, but generally speaking, most practice sites function really well with just a home page, an about page, services page, some sort of content hub, whether that's a blog or something else, and a contact page. I hope this cleared some of the cobwebs for you and sparked some new ideas. I know copywriting can seem overwhelming and a little intimidating, but ultimately all that is really required to be an effective communicator is curiosity, empathy, and a willingness to adapt in light of new information, AKA the superpowers you're probably taking for granted in your work every day. If you'd like more on any of this, you're welcome to connect with me over on my website at drmichaela.com slash simple practice. I'll pull together some free resources for you there. You can explore them whenever you're ready, but thanks so much for joining me and happy writing. Thank you so much, Michaela, for that insightful content. I know our audience is going to love being able to take these actionable items and use it for their websites and copy. I just would like to remind everybody that this webinar will be sent out in the follow-up email going out tomorrow morning. We're also offering those interested in creating a Simple Practice account an exclusive offer of two months free just for attending these webinars. You'll find all the information needed in that same follow-up email tomorrow morning. Thank you all for the work that you do every day. We'll see you again soon.